Hello to you, everyone who is listening or watching remotely. My name is Beatrice Adler Bolton. I'll briefly introduce myself momentarily, but first I'm going to begin with the COVID-19 community safety announcements, and then I will um, introduce the session and participants. So first, the COVID-19 announcement. Reminder, all socialism conference attendees are required to wear masks, fully covering the nose and mouth while indoors in conference spaces, including hallways and meeting rooms. Speakers from the front of the sessions will not be removing their masks in order to deliver their presentations at this session, and audience members are required to wear masks even when asking questions or making comments. The mask policy is in place to protect all of us, especially the immunocompromised, from the risk of contracting COVID-19. Second, the community safety announcement. The conference community safety plan relies in part on badge checkers at the door of each room, and all attendees are expected to wear their conference badges at all times to enter conference meeting rooms. Please respect the badge, badge checkers and know they are here to support a safe conference. Um, you can see registration if you have problems. And thank you also to our interpreter or interpreters. <laughs> okay, so today we are here to talk about a recent resurgence of forms of carcerality that contribute to the targeted oppression and removal of mad and mentally ill populations under the guise of providing treatment or care. So first, you know, thank you so much for being here today to be a part of this ongoing conversation that we've been having, you know, throughout the uh, sessions that Death Panel has been putting together about the ways that health and disability intersect with all of our movements. The session is really, um, attempting to bring together some important and sometimes disparate ideas. Um, so this one was actually gonna have a shorter discussion portion than our other sessions. Um, we'll be taking a smaller stack, but uh, at 6 p.m. across the street, uh, we're gonna be doing a death panel meetup in the open park area where there's uh, benches and all sorts of stuff out there. So um, even though we'll have a smaller stack today, you know, it is being live streamed. This is the kind of thing where some of the conversations we want to have, we don't necessarily want like broadcast publicly. Um, so please, you know, if you can come and join us during the lunch break, we can talk, you know, folks can meet up. Um, it'll be a great way to sort of talk about what we're going to learn today and, you know, continue to have this conversation together. So uh, my name is Beatrice Other Bolden. Again, I'm the co-author of the book Health Communism and a co-host of the Death Panel Pos podcast, which is sponsoring this session and I am truly, truly honored to be joined on stage today by my comrades, um, Liat Ben Moshe and Leah Harris. Liat Ben Moshe is Associate Professor of Criminology, Law and Justice at the University of Illinois at Chicago and author of the fantastic book, really fucking good, uh, Decarcerating Disability, Deinstitutionalization and Prison Abolition. Leah Harris is a mad and disabled writer, facilitator, and advocate whose work has appeared in The Progressive, The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and Mad in America. So thank you both so much for being a part of this. Um, as many survivors of psychiatric systems will tell you, psychiatric incarceration is not treatment, it's violence. Liat, as you write about in your book, the movement to close the old massive systems of warehousing, the asylum, the estate hospital system, can be thought about as part of the continuum of organizing against the prison industrial complex. And there are many lessons to be learned from looking at psychiatric care through the lens of prison abolition. So that's what we're gonna do today. For example, if we're very successful in closing a site of imprisonment, but people end up incarcerated in a different site of imprisonment, this is not a win, this is a reformist reform, and this is a case in which we learn. And we're here today to learn together because after decades of struggle to end psychiatric incarceration, recently there has been a deeply worrying and rising return to past practices. It can be really hard to spot, and this is what we're gonna focus on today because what carceral sanism actually delivers us is back to an era akin to the age of the carceral psychiatric ward. And that is why resisting Carceral Satanism must be central to the left's agenda, and especially to work that is already a part of the abolitionist movement. So, let's jump right in. Liat, can you start us off by, sorry, my, I had coffee right before. <clears throat> Liat, can you start off by talking about this term, 
that you coined, actually, carceral sanism. You know, let's walk through what it is and how to spot it. All right, hello, everybody. <laughs> Can people usually hear, hear me okay in the back of the room? It's working, yay. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Beatrice. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Um, thank you for the amazing Death Panel podcast. How many of you know about the Death Panel podcast? Raise your hand or another body. Now you're embarrassing. Yes, yes, yes. So vast majority, but if you don't, um, you should totally listen in. And just, um, I don't know if it's a spoiler alert or you were going to kind of uh, say it at the end, but um, Leah and myself and uh, Vest for more are going to do um, a podcast um, with Beatrice on this very topic. Um, we're going to record it in about two weeks, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I wanted to um, say that at the beginning because um, we're not going to have time to kind of delve into all of the issues in depth, but in the podcast, I think we will much more. So um, stay tuned for that. So uh, first of all, what is carceral sanism, which is a term um, that I use. Um, so I want to... First of all, give a definition of both of those words, um, just to kind of get us started. So um, for people who don't know what ableism and sanism is, I'll just give a brief definition. Ableism is the uh, oppression that people face due to disability, and it could be perceived or actual lived disability, um, which not only says that disability is a form of difference, but it makes it inferior. So that's what ableism is. Um, and sanism, very similarly, is the oppression faced by those who are deemed uh, mad or crazy, uh, mentally ill, psychologically disabled, and also sanism, sanism is the imperative to be sane, to be rational, to be not crazy and mentally ill and psychiatrically disabled. So, um, that's the second part of the, the word. Carcerality, uh, what we mean by that is uh, confinement, but also the logics of kind of um, capture, <laughs> of locking up, uh, not only through criminalization, and this is really important, but also carcerality can come from medicalization and through pathologization. And by the way, when we say here medicalization, I want us to be clear that we're not conflating that with medical care. Um, so if you didn't go to the first death panel, um, panel <laughs> um, yesterday, <laughs> where they kind of explained that, just so you know, um, that for us medicalization is, is a process, um, much like um, pathologization, criminalization, it's a process that's done. It's not, it doesn't mean access to medical care. Um, so carcerality is, um, about pathologization and both of those things uh, entail, both medicalization and criminalization entail surveillance, they entail policing, they entail confinement, and yet usually when we say carcerality, we usually talk about criminalization but not medicalization. And today we wanna do both. So that is what carceral sanitism does, it's that it brings those two nexuses, the medicalization and the criminalization. I also wanna say that carceral sanism and sanism and ableism generally and their uneven relation to labor extraction, to disablement, to confinement, to surveillance, to policing, they are constructed on anti-blackness and on colonialism. So I want that to be clear that whenever we say sanism, that's what we mean. Uh, the way that it's connected to anti-blackness anti and colonialism even if it doesn't only affect people of color and indigenous people. It's based on that uh, formation. So lastly, the actual definition of carceral sanism, uh, which will help us spot it, is that it's the practice and belief that people with disabilities need special or extra protections, that people with disabilities need special or extra protections in ways that often expand and legitimate their further man marginalization and incarceration. So for example, um, that people with disabilities need special units in prison, um, that they need their own institutions, that they need special treatments, special professionals, um, 
things like mental health courts, solitary units in prison, uh, social workers instead of police in mental health crisis, and so on. So it's the expansion of the carceral state through uh, other means. So it builds on the concept of carceral sanism, builds on um, concepts like carceral humanism that uh, Jim Kilgore uses, um, carceral feminism, the ways that in which the, um, the carceral state um, expands over the backs of particular populations, in this case, people with um, disability, and the use, the way um, pathologization, medicalization is used as justification for this carceral expansion. You need this care, it's benevolent, it's for you, it's for your own good, but it's carceral. Thank you so much, Liad. I mean, and you know, it's, it's um, Liad's work is so tremendously central to the work that we do on Death Panel and the rise in carceral sanism that we have seen um, over the last five years, but especially, you know, accelerating during the pandemic has been um, incredibly frustrating because sometimes we see these narratives advanced by our own comrades, by folks on the left. This is not something that any one part of the political spectrum has like uh, dominion over, right? Like this is, there's no monopoly on this ideology. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the conversation, you know, the call to reopen the massive total institutions that, you know, the MAD Pride, disability rights, disability justice, self-advocacy, and neurodivergent movements have worked for, you know, I would say decades in my notes, but it's actually centuries um, to try and dismantle is a hot topic, you know, recently mentioned as a kind of magical thinking, silver bullet solution to literally just get rid of folks living on the streets by removing them visually out of sight, out of mind, has been the strategy for managing madness for many, many centuries now. And from all across the political spectrum, we're seeing attempts to return to the heyday of the total institution, from conservative Republicans like Florida politician Matt Goetz, who uh, called for reopening the asylums because, quote, the Democrats are purposefully riling up their nutty shock troops in the hopes they will terrorize normal Americans into submission. But to Democrats like New York City Mayor Eric Adams, who has you know, expanded involuntary hospitalization and California Governor Gavin Newsom's care courts and you know, they, they police houselessness and funnel people into what tenants organizer Tracy Rosenthal has called forced alternatives. You know, this is not something that we are seeing exclusively from you know, Republicans, conservatives, et cetera. There is no ideological monopoly, as I said, on calls to lock people up under the guise of treatment. Sometimes, you know, carceral sanus reforms sometimes are even bound up in things that we want and are working towards, like diverting funding away from the police or setting up new systems of 911, 911 call diversion to stop the police from showing up when someone's in a mental health crisis. As Liat's talking about some of the ways that carcerality expands under the guise of treatment, you know, um, fits into things that are very common talking points in the abolitionist movement, like social workers are sometimes cops, right? But we have to understand it as part of a broader process, not just as like this job function is bad, right? It's, it's not about good or bad people, it's about how is this being instrumentalized? So Leah, you have been following a lot of these resurgent calls to reopen the asylum part of the broader resurgence to, re to roll back all sorts of protections that have been really hard fought. So can you talk about some of the things that have been um, so far tangibly eroded under this recent resurgence of carceral sanism and how that's being justified to just sort of set up what the landscape is right now? Absolutely, and um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be here today with y'all and just wanted to add my appreciation for Liat's work, for the death panel's work on this. Um, and just to share that, you know, I really come at this um, as a second generation survivor of psychiatric oppression. You know, this is a generational struggle, and I really hope that that gets highlighted in, you know, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so just to kind of like touch on the current moment, I mean, there's just so much we could talk about here, and I hope we'll get into it. 
Um, but it's so hard also to disentangle it from the history, right, which we'll also get into a little bit later in the discussion. Um, but yeah, like Beatrice said, you know, this carceral sanism is really exemplified by this very alarming and rising tide of policy pushes that are meant to erode and eradicate uh, hard-won legal standards, right, regarding forced psychiatric intervention, who gets it, who does not get it, right? And in addition to Liat's um, book and the work that Death Panel's doing, I also, if you wanna look more in depth in this, I recommend the book, Your Consent is Not Required by Rob Wypond, which uh, came out earlier this year. It's a good resource. Um, Rob Wypond, W-I-P-O-N-D. Um, so, you know, I'm no believer that uh, the legal system can save us or that it should be the primary lever of change necessarily. But it's really important to understand that these are some of the only due process protections that we as mad and disabled people have, right, in this, in this country. And there's this really disturbing framing, and maybe you'll spot it in the media and with, you know, the politicians and the pundits, but that, you know, rights exist on a continuum, right? And it's like, oh, we've gone way too far in this direction. We need to fix the pendulum swing that has gone too far in the direction of mad people's rights, right? And there's this ongoing effort by the ruling class to correct this, right? And so, you know, as Beatrice said, these ideas are really embedded in both liberals' thinking, in conservatives' thinking, across the right, and even, you know, can be found in left movements. Um, so, you know, of course, there's these calls to reopen the asylum or bring back the asylum. There was a really shitty Washington, uh, not Washington, Wall Street Journal piece about this quite recently. But, but what we're really seeing today is a far more diffuse asylum, right? Involving this maze of outpatient commitment schemes and quote specialty or quote problem solving courts like mental health and drug courts and veterans courts, right, that have evolved over the last couple of decades. So essentially extending the asylum into the community through these tentacles of coercion, right? And uh, another resource on that that I really recommend is the Beyond Problem Creating Courts a document that's um, put out by Interrupting Criminalization. Um, and what I wanna say just before I get into like some of the current stuff is that Multiple studies have shown, you know, over decades now that all forms of psychiatric force and coercion, um, the quote, serious mental illness designation and these associated diagnoses um, land hardest on black and brown folks due to, you know, the very well established white supremacist, you know, foundations of psychiatry and all of these systems. And for more on this, I really recommend the protest psychosis, how schizophrenia became a black disease. Um, that's by Jonathan Metzl, M-E-T-Z-L. Um, and there's also a very strong intersection here with anti, the anti-trans legislation and policies that are you know, taking over as well. Um, there's an account um, called at mercifully mad on Instagram who's been writing about this. Um, and saying, quote, uh, transphobia and sanism are built upon each other with the idea that being trans is, quote, crazy, and to be crazy is to be deserving of having your autonomy removed by the state. You know, so really, really bringing forth how all of these forms of oppression are intersecting and interlocking in this carceral sanist way. So as, you know, houselessness grows in this country for all the reasons we here at Socialism Conference know very, very well, there's been this trend, I'm sure many of you are following this, it's been covered, you know, wonderfully on uh, death panel um, of these democratic mayors and governors pushing uh, regimes of force on the so-called untreated mentally ill population who's living outside, right? So we see this in the form of the uh, Mayor Eric Adams um, involuntary removals policy. I mean, it's just so disgusting that it's like just laid out there so bare. Um, and when he announced this policy last November, he really, really doubled down on the coercion as compassion trope, right? So, so saying, 
Um, he said, if severe mental illness is causing someone to be unsheltered and a danger to themselves, we have a moral obligation to get them the treatment and care that they need, right? So it's couched in this language of, of morality. Um, and the intro to Adam's terrible legislation, leg legislative plan, which you all tore apart on <laughs> death panel in, a, in excellent detail, uh, it says, quote, when voluntary care, while voluntary care is always preferable, it is not always a realistic expectation when a person in the throes of psychosis does not believe they are ill. Like we're gonna definitely come back to this theme over and over again. And this is the best part of it. Uh, he says, and or has delusions that the mental health professionals seek to harm rather than help them, right? So just really highlighting that in this framework, if you object to your treatment, if you object to any of that, that's seen as a symptom of your serious mental illness. It's really, really terrifying. Um, so again, you know, this is like blaming houselessness on individuals' brains rather than these structural causes. Um, and even responding to Jordan Neely's murder, you know, he doubles down on this, on this um, trope, you know, saying, I want to say up front that there were many people who tried to help Jordan get the support he needed. But the tragic reality of severe mental illness is that some who suffer from it are at times unaware of their own need for care, right? So again, coming back to this calling people unaware lacking insight. Um, I'll go into like, there's a whole scientific designation, pseudo-scientific designation for this as well. Um, and then shifting over to California, but I do wanna just emphasize, we can't talk about it all today, but these policies are occurring all across the country. It's not just a New York, California thing at all. Um, but yeah, there's the rise in this um, regime of so-called care courts. Have you all heard about the care courts? Okay, I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, again, compelling, quote, care on the same groups of people living outside under the threat of a conservatorship if they don't comply with their, quote, care plan. And again, just noticing the similarities in language, um, when care court legislation was enacted, um, it was about a year ago, I think it was September of, of 2022, um, Newsom, Governor Newsom used the same kind of coercion as compassion, moral obligation language as Adams did, saying, today's passage of the CARE Act means hope for thousands of Californians suffering from severe forms of mental illness who too often languish on our streets without the treatment they desperately need and deserve, right? And this is, you know, we all know this is extremely disingenuous, but it's also like there was last, or I think, yeah, it was this year, um, UC San Francisco did the largest survey of unhoused people since like 1999. And they found, this is not gonna be a surprise to anyone in this room, but that the primary cause of houselessness was people not being able to afford rent. Like shocker, right? Wow, you know, like amazing. We had to study this and come to this conclusion not, quote, untreated mental illness and substance use, which is always, right, the stated pretext for all of this policy. Um, and then there's the last couple things I'm gonna say, I know I've been talking a lot, um, is that Governor Newsom is also seeking right now, as we speak, this legislation is moving to, quote, modernize the system, that's the language they're using, by overhauling the 2004 Mental Health Services Act, right, which is funded by taxing the rich, and he wants to divert funds away from community and peer-led um, organizations to programs really that are designed to administer the disappearance, surveillance, and cure of unhoused people, right? One of the advocates called it big box programs. Um, and this modernization scheme also includes SB 43, which is this bill that's currently making its way through the legislature and it expands the definition of grave disability, right? So making it much easier to involuntarily commit people to locked facilities. And if y'all follow the California's big city mayor's movement, um, they have come out swinging, very excited about this, what is called conservatorship reform. Um, and just the very last thing I'll say on this for now is that, you know, impacted folks who actually worked very hard to input into the Mental Health Services Act like 20 years ago, 
and peer workers and advocates, they've been totally shut out of this process. That's what folks on the ground are saying, which is, you know, this process is being led by Newsom and the social worker turned state senator, um, Senator Eggman. So I'll, I'll just leave it there um, for now. Yeah, thank you. Leah, thank you so much for laying that out. I mean, just my blood pressure went up with, like, I know those quotes so well, right? And even just hearing them read out loud, the faux compassion, the faux morality, it's um, almost the standard way that people talk about this, right? Like, this is not some outlier of terrible speech um, uh, against people with mental illness labels. This is very common. You know, you probably have friends that may have talked to you like this before, and it can be really hard. Um, but I think to be able to properly talk about what is at stake here, um, we need to take a moment now and look back at history. Uh, I mentioned um, the idea of deinstitutionalization, um, you know, a couple times now, and, and Liat's book uh, is obviously concerned uh, with the movement for deinstitutionalization. De and Liat, I really um, appreciate, and I know you know that I appreciate this, but it's so important, the way that you talk about deinstitutionalization in your work as being and meaning many things at once, specifically kind of three overlapping things. Um, so can you walk through sort of what deinstitutionalization is and how you think about it? Because, you know, to kind of understand what we're potentially losing here, the things that Leah set up, we kind of have to understand like what the system was like before. Um, sure. Before I, uh, thank you, Beatrice. Before I do that, I just want to do an access check. Um, there's a bunch of people standing and sitting, which is fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, but if folks that don't mind having people sit next to them, there's a lot of open chairs. If you can just raise your hand so people can see. Okay, so there's a lot of chairs open. So if anybody on the floor or standing wants to sit, you can. Um, all right. But you don't have to. Okay, so... Um, Thank you for that question, Beatrice. Um, I also wanted to say um, something about, uh, before we kind of go back in time to talk about, just for one second, um, some of the like Chicago examples in mm. re regards to what Leah was um, mentioning, um, which is related to the deinstitutionalization. Uh, because what happened in Chicago, um, you know, now there's uh, ordinances to um, basically take money off from the police, so like put defund, the police into um, into action and use that money to reopen the mental health clinics, especially on the south side, that Ram Emanuel closed in 2012. In 2012, and some people kind of conflate that with uh, deinstitutionalization. That was like a little bit different, and I'll talk in a second why. But um, my point is that. The reason why, and I think we're all on the panel very much for <laughs> defunding the police and taking the money and putting that into the hands of uh, mental health um, service users or um, you know community centers, uh, but we're kind of a little bit wary of taking the money and saying we're going to open like medical clinics, you know, with it. Um, and so I think that the last point you were mentioning, Leah, is really, 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 really important, and I don't know how much more, you know. To emphasize it, that the um, things were taken, you know, from um, service users, from like med movements, from peer-led um, movements that you know knew this is coming. They knew what they wanted, and nobody's asking us anymore. Um, and so, you know, when we're not on the table, I think that this is like when some of the issue is coming from. And I think that this is why, for me, deinstitutionalization. Um, is, is uh, like Beatrice was saying, was three things. One of them was, I think, um, what people understand the institutionalization to be, which is the closure of the psych hospitals, the closure of uh, institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Secondly, it was the kind of movement of people um, into community living. So it's not just that sites of incarceration close, but also that people, um, you know, kind of change... Uh, um, um, it changed people's lives, right, into, into living in the community. But thirdly, that it was a movement, 
you know, the deindustrialization was a movement, and it was led by a lot of people. Some of them were people who were institutionalized and um, self-advocates, med movements, also um, allies, you know, like doctors and physicians and nurses and, you know, practitioners that were like, what, what is this? You know, what is this mess? Um, lawyers, uh, activist lawyers, I mean, parents, a lot, a lot of people. But it's really important to think about it in this three-pronged way because um, it's, uh, when we don't think about it as a movement, we just think about it as a process like that happened over time. Um, that you know, Reagan closed all the institutions, that was deinstitutionalization. And okay, you can, in a very narrow way, you can look at it like that, but I'm trying to push for a more kind of, um, there were strands of abolition in deinstitutionalization, and I think those need to be celebrated. And they weren't always, and they weren't all the time, and they sure weren't when Reagan closed psychiatric <laughs> hospitals, but I think if we only leave um, you know, one version of the story, then we get a story, you know, of failure, we get a story of um, um, what have you done, you know, um, you know, mad activists and self-advocates and, you know, the disability um, activists. And I think that that is, um, you know, very problematic. So I wanted to leave us with kind of three questions, one in relation to each of, of the, the three prongs uh, before we move on. Um, so if we look at the institutionalization as the transition of people with psychiatric and intellectual or, or developmental disabilities from state institutions into community living, the question is where did people end up? Um, and I think that um, the story is a little bit uh, different in terms of um, people with intellectual developmental disabilities and, and people with psychiatric disabilities, and we don't have time to get into it, but it's about historical processes and funding and a lot of stuff. Um, but the question still remains, is like where did people end up and what kind of community living did they get? Um, I think that that's a really important question and also the gendered and race distribution of caregiving and labor that people ended up outside of the institution which meant that, for example, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that get uh, funding from the states, and so we can track this, um, a lot of um, the labor is done by a, a family caregiver, mostly a mother or a sister. And um, even though this means that people can live in the community, uh, they live with their family, as uh, a lot of us have, actually all of us, with some kind of family until a, uh, a particular age, um, and that's great, but there's no kind of uh, financial or other support you know, for that. So it becomes really kind of a feminist and a racial justice um, issue, and sometimes uh, an immigration issue as well. Um, and the um, other question in relation to that, um, where did people end up, is you know, there's a discussion in Australia right now about reparations for people who were uh, institutionalized. Um, also in Massachusetts, by the way, but um, in Australia more generally, they're trying to kind of push for um, literal like reparations for people who were institutionalized or people um, including in, in nursing home facilities um, that's starting to be kind of conversation, but particularly in uh, kind of these large state institutions. Um, secondly, if the institutionalization was the closure of large uh, institutions and psychiatric hospitals, the question is what happened to the buildings? Um, and one of the things that happened, uh, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, is uh, you know some of them became prisons, um, as you might imagine. Some of them became other sites of you know carcerality in some kind of way, um, and some of them became like haunted attractions. So just you know keep your eyes out for Halloween. Um, some of them were actual you know facilities in which people lived and died. Don't go on those haunted things. Um, and then lastly, um, if deinstitutionalization is, is a process, it's a movement, it's a movement about anti-segregation. It's a movement in which people, particularly people with intellectual disabilities, and I can't emphasize this enough, which are people that we often don't listen, we never kind of ask what people with intellectual disabilities uh, need or want. And they said very early on, like in the 70s, that nobody should be incarcerated they even use the words, but nobody should be incarcerated or institutionalized uh, in an institution, regardless of the disability, because what was, they were trying to push on them, um, very much related to what you were saying, um, is that, yes, people deserve to live in the community, but you know, if they have very complex like, medical needs, or if their disabilities are very severe, you know, surely they need to live in the institution. And so self-advocates organization early on said, no, 
nobody should live in an institution, period, never. And that became you know, a very, um, you know, the stance of, um, of uh, self-advocacy and other disability movement. Thank you so much, Leon. I feel like so often, you know, you just look at facility closure and you're like, oh, that's deinstitutionalization, right? But part of what uh, Liat's book does so well is sort of talks about really how, you know, things like Rahm Emanuel closing a couple mental hospitals or Ronald Reagan, you know, the way that these proposals also are fronted, right? Like the uh, idea is like, okay, well, you know, we got to close these things. They're so expensive, but the money doesn't get funneled back into anything else, right? Like the programs aren't there. Some of these institutions closed and uh, group homes and small treatment centers popped up on the perimeter of the old facility. You know, um, that's an example Liat talks about in her book, like people who were moving into homes in the community, into group homes, uh, their neighbors firebombed and bombed the group home before people, I mean, people have burned um, to death in group homes that have been bombed while people were in them. But, you know, there is a, there is a kind of logic to deinstitutionalization, right, where it's not simply the closure of an institution. It's also the building of something else and many, many other options that could be on the table have never, ever been on the table. And that's really important to sort of understand, which is that, you know, people like Gavin Newsom, Matt Goetz, um, Eric Adams, they pretend like we've tried everything already. And so all we have left is to go back to the one thing that was working, right, which is large scale institutions. And this is the framework that we're seeing all over. Um, so, you know, just to sort of zoom in actually on the example of California again for a moment. You know, prior to the late 1960s, many, many more people with disabilities and mental health diagnosis labels lived their entire lives or most of their lives in state hospitals or large institutions. Um, in 1967, California passed the Lanterman Petrus Short Act, LPS that sought to end uh, inappropriate and indefinite confinement of people diagnosed with mental health disorders by establishing like a couple controls, you know, like really simple things, right to prompt psychiatric evaluation and treatment, for example. And it's not a rare occurrence to be doing um, archival research on folks living in asylums and institutions and read in their file that in 30 or 40 years, they never once received one session of therapy, for example. In, uh, in health communism, we talk about a woman named Margaret incarcerated in New York State's Willard Hospital from 1941 until she died in 1973. Um, she never once had a single session of psychotherapy, which is what she was there to receive. That's why her doctor sent her there. Every day she was given a heavy dose of Thorazine and she described her experience as like being a fly trapped in a spider web. So I just wanna emphasize the landscape of so-called care and treatment that this legal framework in California was sort of trying to intervene in, right? Um, so Leah, can you talk us through some of these, you know, weedsy uh, historical moments that I think offer us, you know, not just a picture into what things were like and what we're trying to resist a return to, but help us also understand sort of how this fits into, you know, structurally some of the other movements that I think a lot of people are, are also involved in. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think again, you know, it's so critical to, to really, um, to understand this history because it's actively what it, they're trying to, you know, eradicate and, and roll back the clock half a century right now. Um, so yeah, just even that, you know, to think that just 50 years ago, you know, people could be committed to asylums, you know, just like Beatrice talked about, even for life, um, solely based on the testimony of a few psychiatrists, right? And the judge almost always sided with the psychiatrist's re uh, recommendation. And the prevailing legal document or uh, doctrine that um, allowed for this was called Perrin's I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But it, it essentially assumes the state, right, to be this benevolent force, 
right, that is intervening for the, quote, best interests of people seen unable, deemed unable to care for themselves, right? And again, that's really what's at stake here, given all of these concerted efforts among the ruling class to roll back the clock to these parents' patriae day, days. Um, so, you know, just to kind of talk a little bit more about the, you know, uh, deinstitutionalization process and how that unfolded in law um, in the 60s and 70s, um, you can really see a wave of what was called the due process revolution, right? And it shifted to this legal orientation where psychiatric incarceration was seen as similar to incarceration, jails, prisons, right, other carceral sites, um, and, and in need of due process protections, right? So it shifted the burden to the state to prove, um, you know, these standards of imminent danger, which, you know, I'm not a fan of, but that's how it unfolded, um, imminent danger to themselves or others, right? And then also kind of, it evolved into different definitions of grave disability, which is very much at stake here right now in terms of, you know, whether or not one is able to care for themselves, care for their needs, you know, which gets into the rhetoric stated by, um, you know, Newsom and Adams and folks like them. So, so yeah, the due process revolution, it includes the Lannerman Petrus Short Act with which Beatrice just talked about, right? Establishing a much higher bar for taking away someone's liberty and re institutionalizing, institutionalizing them against their will. And it also put in a number of safeguards around protecting people from conservatorships, right? Where you, you just literally have no decision-making control over any aspect of your life, right? Like, that, like Brittany. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know, and Brittany, as you all can imagine, is not really like the face no. of conservatorship, <laughs> but, but really helped to get this issue on the map, you know, thankfully. Um, so it's, you know, really looking at these LPS protections when we're talking about California, it's precisely what is being targeted by the Newsom administration, right, in the name of modernization. That's what makes it such an extra mind fuck, because it's like they're, talk they're using the language of progress, but this is actually very, very regressive. Um, and so just, again, at the same time that LPS was established in California, there's also a similar reforms happening around the country. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the cases of this time period, but one that I've studied in depth, um, being from born in Wisconsin, um, is the Lassard decision of 1972, which is very similar. Um, Alberta Lassard was this Milwaukee woman who was actually facing lifetime commitment to this horrific facility built in the 1880s, um, just basically for being an outspoken person who was like probably seen by people as eccentric, right? But she really fought back and won. So the, the Lassard decision, similar to LPS, made it difficult, again, to commit someone against their will. And it, it had this kind of national impact because a lot of other states immediately, um, you know, followed suit with reforms based on Lissard. Um, of course, since then, these very, very stringent standards have continued to be eroded. And we have this like hodgepodge of state laws that you all have talked about, you know, on death panel. And I also, if you kind of want to learn more about the hodgepodge, um, I definitely recommend the Committable podcast, which has been systematically covering the laws state by state, talking to folks from those states. So you can get a sense of how they're similar and how they differ. Um, but even after you had this due process revolution, you know, it did, it did change things, but you still absolutely had this phenomenon of mad and disabled people being forced into institutions, like continuing into the 90s. Um, so, you know, if you get to the, once we get to the mid 90s, there's another really, really landmark case um, uh, with uh, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson, who were uh, women living with intellectual and psychiatric disabilities. And they were being confined against their will in Georgia institutions, right? And became the plaintiffs in uh, Olmstead versus LC. And this case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1999, they held that institutional confinement is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it really moved forward this unqualified right that Liat was talking about for people to receive supports in the community in what is known as the least restrictive setting, 
So then you had this whole wave of Olmstead cases that followed, ushering in this kind of next phase of deinstitutionalization. But then, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, what Dr. Angela Davis said yesterday about the backlash, right? Because immediately after the, or at the same time as the Olmstead reforms are happening, you had this push for involuntary outpatient commitment, right? Moving the commitment, not in the traditional asylum with four walls, but taking it into the community, right? So at the same year that Olmstead was decided, in 1999, Kendra's law was the first involuntary outpatient commitment law that was passed in New York City, right, in New York. And this term, so you will hear this term euphemized and sold to the public as assisted outpatient treatment. Do you see how that changes from involuntary outpatient commitment, which is like what it is, to this very sane washed, you know, whitewashed kind of way of talking about it? Um, it's called AOT. So they, now these laws are in 47 states, um, and they're relying on what's called the black robe effect with these judges compelling folks to comply with treatment, generally in the form of medication, whether they want it or not, under the threat of inpatient hospitalization, right, if you do not comply with your court-ordered plan. And so just to kind of show how it's like the same players are coming around and around with this shit, um, this, key, this key guy who was part of enacting Kendra's law, his name is Brian Stetton, he now advises Mayor Adams 20 years later, 20, 30, whatever, I can't do math, <laughs> but all these years later on his serious mental illness policy, right? So it's the same people. And, you know, he used to be, Stetton used to be the um, policy director of what the Treatment Advocacy Center, which is this right-leaning think tank that has really been pushing the AOT laws and fighting for these laws to get um, on the books all across the country. Um, and just wanna share just a few extra things about the backlash, that these efforts you know, to roll back the clock are not new. Um, almost immediately after the Lassard decision, there was this Wisconsin psychiatrist named Daryl Treffert, and he began sharing anecdotes about people who were found not committable under the new laws and who went on to die by suicide or other causes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and he coined the term dying with their rights on. Has anybody ever heard this before? Um, it has become this rallying cry among, you know, coalitions of medical authorities, family advocates, you know, policymakers trying to roll back these laws. And you can hear that trope to this, these, this day, right? When you talk about people's rights, you're saying, well, you just want them to just die with their rights on, huh? Like, it's like you're pro-death, you know, if you're kind of speaking up for people's uh, bodily autonomy. Um, yeah, so you'll hear politicians say this all the time. The, the state senator in California who's pushing the modernization with Newsom was quoted as using that language. And you're, if you object to what they're doing, it's like, oh, you're fine with people just being on the streets and in prisons. Like, you know, that's how they shut folks down. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is like, there's this kind of um, groundhog phenomenon, groundhog day phenomenon. I think I keep kind of thinking of these as like undead policies that just keep popping up over and over. Um, so I found this New York Times article from 1987 describing almost identical initiative to Adams spearheaded by Mayor Koch. Mm -hmm who argued that the pendulum, again, pendulum swinging too far, you know, and say they were rounding people up with vans, right? And of course the difference with the Adams policy now is it's cops, where the vans before were like social workers and nurses and psychiatrists. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, what's really interesting is uh, of course that policy failed <laughs> because it's not addressing the root causes um, of houselessness and everything we're talking about. But what came out of that failure, <coughs> excuse me, was the rise of the housing first model in the early 1990s, which is still considered the best practice in permanent uh, supportive housing. It's not perfect, but it's, it's really good practice. And, you know, unlike the kind of services that are being pushed by conservatives who wanna predicate any access to housing, even temporary housing, with sobriety requirements or medication compliance, housing first does not have preconditions and it's more aligned with like a harm reduction framework. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, this is kind of where we're at today. Uh, 
is that Housing First has also been at the center of these wars of criminalization with conservatives arguing that like deinstitutionalization, Housing First has failed, right? You'll see that in the news and the conservative you know, publications and whatnot, when in reality it actually has never been funded or tried on anywhere near the scale that's needed, but they're declaring it dead and now we need to force people into housing with all of these preconditions and requirements. So I will leave it there. No, I love that you brought up uh, the way that this really is kind of like such a throwback in New York to the to the late 80s. Um, I pulled up a quote from Koch from an early draft of Health Communism from a chapter that got pulled out to be its own book, actually. Um, Ed Koch, the then mayor of New York City, insisted in 1986 that, quote, families were voluntarily becoming homeless and taking the welfare hotel route in order to get better apartments. Koch was pushing back on a report his own administration had ordered, which demonstrated that gentrification and redevelopment was largely responsible for the sudden rise in the city's homeless population. Koch said that the report contradicted his gut feelings and what he had observed <laughs> anecdotally in New York City shelters. I mean, sounds so f fucking familiar, right? Um, uh, which he charged were full to the brim with the criminally mentally ill. Two years later, Koch maintained that, quote, these homeless people, you can tell who they are. They're sitting on the floor talking to themselves. Many, not all, but many, or panhandling. And the thing that was, like, so frustrating is we had pulled this chapter out, like, this has to be its own book. And then Eric, what does Eric Adams do a year later after the manuscript's locked in but repeat exactly the same line, right? Like, you can tell who they are. That is such an important sort of touchstone here. Um, and Leah, I really so appreciate the way you laid it out. It takes, you know, a lot of work to make the weeds really accessible like that. And I feel like one of the things that, um, you know, is important here is like, as we've said, a lot of the justification for this is the idea that deinstitutionalization failed, right? We tried to let people go and look at what happened. Sometimes the narrative is that we let people go and all those people are now in prisons, um, which is absolutely not true. Um, and Leah, you know, as we're saying, um, your work is really, really important to understanding this analysis. You know, can we talk about like what, if any, truth there might be behind the idea that deinstitutionalization failed? But more importantly, I think, you know, why is it such a common narrative, right? The the sort of idea that the closure of institutions uh, and asylums resulted directly in the rise of folks living on the streets. And I think really importantly, you know, this common sense narrative, um, I'd love for us to talk about also who that serves. Um, I'll try to do this in like three minutes, but I, um, you know, there's a whole book I wrote about it. Um, <laughs> but, and I'm very wordy, the book is very long, so I'm so, really, really sorry. So um, I can't, you know, um, do justice in three minutes, but I would say that um, you know there's a lot of uh, actual empirical reason I'm in my day job like a social scientist, so there's actually empirical ways to show that um, deinstitutionalization did not actually lead to the rise in homelessness and then to the rise of incarceration, including the fact that these are not the same populations, it didn't happen in the same time, all these kind of things um, you can read about. Um, it's also available for free uh, on my website, like the chapter that this is from. Um, but the, the more interesting question, I think, for us that I can do in three minutes is, is why. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why um, deinstitutionalization is basically blamed for the rise in incarceration, and then what, what does it do, and who does it serve? So it very, very broadly, what it does is that um, it reduces a very complex process about home loss um, and the kind of um, uh, also the laws that Leia was, you know, uh, talking to us, you know, just now, um, as well as the rise in incarceration, and then puts the blame on a very easy target, which is deinstitutionalization. That for some of these um, uh, processes didn't even happen at the same time, right? So it, in some ways, it happened like much earlier, like in the um, 60s. And then we see the rise in homelessness in the 80s, and you're like, wait a minute, um, why are we blaming this on? Like, it doesn't even make logical sense, not not even empirical. And um, what it does is that it diverts uh, our attention and discussion 
from these neoliberal policies that led simultaneously to the growth of the prison system, same time, and to the lack of financial support for people with disabilities to live in the community, and for the rise in housing insecurity. And I'm saying neoliberal not just as a catchphrase, but literally this was the beginning of neoliberalism as a policy, as a cultural phenomena, as an economic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, praxis that was imported from Margaret Thatcher by Reagan. And for those of you who went to the drag show yesterday, uh, we were treated with uh, the ghost of Nancy Reagan um, <laughs> in the drag show. It was phenomenal, but the, this is the, this is, the ghost of the Reagans, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is it. Mm -hmm. um, this is part of the Reaganism legacy, is the, you know, the, the figure of the welfare queen and the failure of the institutionalization. And the fact that some of us, sometimes on the left, like we produce that, um, should give us pause you know, to who are you know, our, our bedfellows here uh, in reproducing uh, this discourse. Because what has happened, uh, of course, during the 80s is the um, evisceration, or starting in the 70s, and then definitely solidifying in the 80s, the evisceration of accessible, affordable housing and services. And deinstitutionalization, of course, did not lead <laughs> to housing insecurity and to increased incarceration, but racism and neoliberalism did uh, through privatization, budget cuts in services and welfare uh, with no funding for housing and any kind of social services. And at the same time, the budgets to corrections, to policing, to punishment skyrocketed. So, you know, we say in the social sciences, um, correlation is not causation. Just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean they led, one led to the other. So digitalization did not lead to the rise of incarceration. Um, and the reason why this is so important uh, is because now we're seeing in the, uh, especially in New York, but a little bit in California as well, that uh, people who are housing insecure, uh, um, uh, who are quote unquote mentally ill, are kind of blamed. Um, it's blamed on deinstitutionalization because in a different era, they would have been in an institution, as if an institution is a home. You know, and I think this is why it's so important to learn from mad movements and mad people to say, what are you all even thinking about saying a, a phrase like that? You know, like in, in a different era, they would have had a home. What home? This was never a home. This is a site of incarceration. And I think not understanding that is, you know, the problem that, that we have. And so for people, um, uh, you know, the second thing that it does then is that it neutralizes this category of the homeless mentally ill as if it's like a group of people. It is not. All those words are socially constructed. There is no homeless mentally ill. The concept of mental illness is a constructed concept. People who uh, embody it sometimes, you know, kind of take up the label, sometimes they don't. But it's really important to understand madness as a difference, as a part of biodiversity. Um, that the line between normal and abnormal is not clear cut. That madness is normal for the people who embody it. That madness is sometimes generative and sometimes it sucks, just like being a woman or being a person of color or being queer, you know, it's magical and unicorn, and also you get to, you know, to go to prison, you know, whatever. Um, and I'm saying get to go, right? Like in scare quotes. And so, you know, that's to say something like, we need to help the homeless mentally ill, as if that group of people actually exists, um, is incredibly problematic. Um, and I really hope that, you know, leaving the session, we don't reproduce that. Um, and lastly, um, the consequences of this kind of idea um, that Beatrice is talking about, painting digitalization as the uh, culprit for um, the rise in incarceration, is that um, it leads to this perverse reality of exactly where we're at, which is calling to bring back the asylum. <laughs> Literally. Um, it's not even hidden, like Leah was saying, it's cops who are taking people away. It's not even the social workers anyway. Like, we don't even need the facade. Right, it's literally um, the uh, uh, reinst calling for reinstitutionalization. So, the '80s are back, y'all. Not just in fashion, um, <laughs> and not just in fascism. Uh, I guess <laughs> also, also in terms of carceral um, sanism. And the last thing is that um, 
what this narrative does is that it really dissuades us from understanding deinstitutionalization as the largest decarceration movement in US history. The largest decarceration movement, think about that, in US history. And if we don't understand it um, as such, um, then we can't learn the lessons of both what to do and what not to do in terms of um, carceral abolition. Mm, Leah, thank you so much. I mean, I, I think I love the way you, you framed bringing in the, the return of the 80s, right? Because so much of, uh, of what we've been talking about, in a way, is another way to talk about like privatization, right? We're saying that um, in some ways, like we need to uh, remove people from public life and public sight um, if their families can't provide to keep them out of sight themselves, right? Um, when people say we need to meet the needs of the homeless mentally ill, of the dangerously mentally ill, they mean their needs of not having to see that person, right? They mean their needs of not having to share space with that person, not having to feel, you know, any type of way about what kind of care that person might not have or what kind of housing that person might not have or food that person might not have. You know, Jordan Neely was murdered for that on the subway in front of everyone. And I think, you know, it's not unreasonable to assume that there were people in that car that felt relief. And that's a terrible sort of thing to like have to admit to ourselves, right? But part of what's going on here is also in this whole framing is the foreclosure of so many other options, right? Um, and I think a great example of this is also when you see people studying cash transfer programs, right? And you see a study that says like unconditional cash, you know, uh, improves homelessness. And then uh, our friend, our good friend of the show, Nathan Tankus was tweeting about this the other day. He's like, and then you go into the like, method section of the paper, and you see how they cut out everyone who had been homeless for more than two years, anyone with a drug diagnosis, anyone with a, you know, suboxone prescription, anybody with a mental health diagnosis. And so you really start to get a picture also of like sort of what this does in terms of both absolving the state of responsibility, absolving, you know, each of us of responsibility, um, every one of us in many ways, and also in sort of privatizing these problems um, and taking them out of the realm of, you know, any kind of framework that could reflect interdependence or a desire to live in community with each other, regardless of, you know, how each of our brains and minds are at any particular moment. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I'd love for us to return back to our current moment um, and sort of walk through the stakes again and discuss the big question, right? Which is what the fuck do we do? <laughs> what is to be done and how do we do it without reproducing carceral sanus reforms, right? Um, because what is at stake is so big here. Um, and then, you know, later maybe during the discussion, maybe later in the park across the street, um, I'm sure we'll get a chance to go in even deeper and sort of how to get involved in psychiatric abolition organizing or how to incorporate resistance to carceral sanism into other organizing work that you're doing or might want to do. But, you know, as we're saying, like, we have seen an incredible resurgence of calls, you know, for um, the end to forced treatment, just as we've seen the resurgence of calls to reinstate things like asylums and, and to uh, make it easier to force treatment. So can we sort of, you know, get into, for example, um, you know, this has been sort of part of a broader series of movements. Mad Pride is a movement with a very long history, and carceral sanism as an idea builds on the work that the Mad Pride movement, you know, has done to sort of collectivize, organize, and dismantle the discrimination and sanism associated with our current standards of care. Um, and, you know, these activists have not only fought for system change, they've organized to free comrades trapped in the system, they have experimented and piloted alternatives to psychiatric hospitals and other places of confinement, some of which we'll hopefully touch on in a little bit, but all of this has been, you know, built on a foundation of this sort of analysis of sanism that really sort of uh, 
looks towards the structural and material conditions that not only demand the removal of mad people from society, but mark them as surplus, mark them as dangerous, mark them as threats. So Leah, I'd love if you could maybe start us here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I mean, one, one piece that we just didn't have a huge amount of time to get into is really at the same time as deinstitutionalization, there is this rise of organized folks fighting for mad liberation, right? And I, I think of things like the Madness Network News publication and the people who wrote in that, a lot of them called themselves ex-inmates, really, as a form of solidarity with all incarcerated people, right? And then, of course, you have the concurrent, you know, anti-psychiatry movement led by the professionals, which is very, very flawed and imperfect. We can't get into all of that. But the combination of these movements, it really was an uh, abolitionist, anti-Sanism approach very, very much. So there you can trace this line, right, going over 50 years to this threat of abolition, even if maybe that wasn't exactly the language that was, was used all of the time. Um, and so now, you know, there really is this continuity and this kind of resurgence that's really exciting of people talking about psychiatric abolition, right, as, as a solidarity movement, as inextricably connected to larger struggles for, um, psych for, for uh, liberation and abolition. So, you know, I think touching on the what do we do, I think it's really kind of like how can we all um, you know, kind of raise those voices and, and raise our own voices in, in talking about psychiatric abolition as a concept and educating about it and getting involved in pushing for it. Um, and yeah, one thing I was gonna say, I really recommend um, reading, there's a, a article, a blog in the Disability Visibility Project called Abolition Must Include Psychiatry and that's by Stella Akua Mensa and Stephanie Kaufman and Thimkulu. Um, and also there's the um, campaign for psych abolition um, in the UK, you know, so those are just a couple of like the current efforts in, in movement building um, that maybe I'll just touch on and um, see if y'all have other things you want to add. I could keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, if you're in Massachusetts or know comrades in Massachusetts, um, there, there's an effort, there's only three states in the U.S. that don't have assisted outpatient treatment, you know, involuntary outpatient commitment. And so you, if you are in Massachusetts or, you know, no folks, you can point them to the Wildflower Alliance um, at wildflowerallianceorg They're working very, very hard to resist this coming to Massachusetts. Um, also, I want to shout out peer-led non-carceral approaches to community support, um, you know, like getting involved with those, helping to start those in the community. I just was certified as a Hearing Voices Network facilitator, and that's like an international movement that's really about for folks who get, you know, diagnosed with psychosis or people who experience altered states. It's this way for people to make meaning and find solidarity in their experiences and it's not automatically viewed as pathology right as the rest of society does so like this is you know an international movement it's there's not a huge ton of groups in the u.s so it's like a really cool opportunity to grow this non-carceral um uh, alternative not even alternative but but peer-led movement um so yeah just checking out opportunities with the hearing voices network usa to you know get trained up in that if that's something you'd be interested in as well as the alternatives to suicide um, is another non-carceral approach because we know it's like, you know, the danger to self or others. That's what gets people involuntarily, you know, locked up. And it's uh, non-carceral. It's developed by folks with their own lived experience of wanting to die. Um, started at also at the Wildflower Alliance. Um, there's even a training this month that's going to be happening if you all want to check it out and they're you know pushing this whole instead of suicide prevention month which is you know that's a very carceral concept alternatives to suicide month they're trying to you know raise that kind of language and framing um also peer delivered respite right in the community i mean that is so important and to you know people have been fighting for that for years places people where people can go alternatives to uh, emergency rooms and other carceral sites when people are, you know, in crisis. 
to get 24 seven peer support and nothing is mandated, right? You know, it's open door, it like a home-like environment. Um, yeah, and then just really pushing back on these ideas that housing first has failed. I think that's really, really critical. Um, demanding, you know, community and civilian led initiatives that are based in abolitionist praxis, right? Like to these co-responder co models or other ways of responding. You know, one of the ones I'm thinking of is revolutionary emergency partners based in Minneapolis, but there's many of them, you know, across the country and we need more and more support for that. Um, yeah, and just, I guess one other thing I would add and, you know, love to hear from, from y'all is, um, just pushing back on casual sanism, right? In conversations when this pops up, right? People who are, th you know, falling into that rhetoric that, you know, prisons are the new asylums or just kind of any of these other sound bites that are really not accurate, just to really have those, you know, conversations so that we can keep educating each other and raising consciousness and raising awareness on that. So. There's tons more that I could say about it, but these are just kind of some ideas. Um, and then the very last thing is um, there are like a lot of different efforts happening, coalitions forming of people who want to organize under the banner of psychiatric abolition. So if you would like to, you know, be, you know, keep up with that, get involved in that, um, we created a little sign up sheet and it's um, bit.ly. BIT, sorry, dot LY slash psychiatric abolition. So, you know, as things are developing, we'd love to, you know, have y'all be in the mix. Is that all uh, lowercase? Yes, BIT dot LY slash psychiatric abolition, all lowercase. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. And um, we, you know, we have a limited amount of time for SAC. We also want to, you know, remind folks: don't share anything with live streaming. Don't share anything <laughs> that you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing publicly on Twitter. Um, I think we're going to take a stack of five. Um, can I see hands up, and we can gauge sort of how many people we think we might need? Can someone who can see better um, count how many hands we have up? Five. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, let's say uh, we'll, we'll go from back to front. So comrade on the back left uh, with a cap on, yes. And then we'll go comrade in the red shirt. And then we'll do uh, comrade in the pink shirt. Someone who is in the back, could you raise your hand a little higher? Yes, uh, comrade in the white mask and then comrade in the black sweater and the white mask behind them. And oh yes, okay, then we'll go back up to here. I think we're going to try and keep it to like one minute. So I'll give you like uh, a warning when we're getting up to there. How does that sound? Great. Awesome. Hi, um, I have had my own like mental health uh, journey. And so this is very personal to me. And I'm 45 years old now. And it was really like a, a span of 20 years before I was able to find treatment and therapy to like kind of manage my own condition. But in my journey, I also saw people that like, I have the fortunate position where I can manage my own condition myself now that I have the tools for that. But other people that I've encountered during my journey, they, they don't have that. I'm just curious, like if people need like periodic or routine treatment and like I draw the, the con like the connection to like retirement homes or medical communities or something like that. How do we prevent that sort of situation from becoming this carceral, um, you know, institutionalized situation for these individuals that you know they they can't manage their own biological or mental mental health issues? I, I guess that's the question. Thank you so much, comrade. We're going to take a couple um, from the second yes. once, and then we'll sort of return to everything. So, thank you, very much. Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, I've been involved in some of the treatment, not trauma organizing in Chicago. And um, I heard earlier uh, a critique of the plan to reopen the mental health clinics. And I wanted to hear a little bit more specifically about the concerns and also um, some good examples of what alternatives might look like. Um, I'm a little new to this, so I feel like I'm kind of piecing it together, but uh, I don't want to just piece it together if you can offer anything just a little bit more concrete for me to grasp. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you so much, comrade. Um, 
pink shirt, right, Diana? You next. Well, I'm going to be as brief as I can. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you so much for this all. Um, I could go on for a long time, but I'm not. Um, so I had, yeah, I was institutionalized for a lot of my teen years in the 90s. I'm very open about that, so it's been on Twitter, um, <laughs> including um, a year and a half in a state mental hospital right before it closed. So I've seen what like the asylum is like, um, and you know, and you know, and <laughs> it's not something worth going back to, um, you know, because like you know, said, it's not a home. Institutions are not homes. Um, and you know, and then later, and then that's the and then the other thing is about like peer work. I actually had done this training in New York City, and it was a five month training, and you're supposed to get an internship and all this cool stuff to be a peer. And I got the training, and then I went and did this internship in this like um, supported housing site in Queens, and it was the most. Um, it was very carceral, and they didn't give me a lot of, like, I wasn't allowed a key or write notes, or they just had me, like, dusting bookshelves and filing paperwork, and I wasn't doing a lot of peer work, and it was the most miserable experience, and I just was like, this is like, it was like being co-opted, and I was just like, this is not how I want to do it, and I've since, like, started doing it in a more informal way, like, you know, you guys are talking about, like, you know, when I do, like, peer Work. Like sometimes even just on the death panel discord, I'll do it, you know, and places like that. And um, yeah, and just, I mean, you know, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't even really know how to end this, but just <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is that, um, and I guess really about the treatment, not trauma, I'll really quickly address that and then I'll go is that um, it's not that the idea of treatment is a bad thing, but the idea of forced care of any kind is not a positive thing. And mm -hmm. what, you have to be careful of how you're, you're offering the care. If, if it's like being offered in a way that's um, responsive to the community and it's based in the community and it's, you know, like um, people have options and choices and, and it's about giving access to it and not imposing it upon people. And that's where it needs to be careful because like you know, somebody said, some, some social workers can be cops. And you know, it's just, you can't, you know, you can't, because that, you know, that's, you can't just move the carcerality from one place to the other. So I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much, comrade. Thank you. And the comrade in the white mask and the gray. I, my question got asked. Okay, uh, comrade in the white mask and the black, and then, uh, oh, actually, sorry, we'll do the white mask and the black in the back, and then the white mask and the black on the front. So I actually just wanted to hear your thoughts on former institutions such as Elgin Mental Health Institution um, or Elgin Mental Health Center now, which have shifted from, you know, being a place for, I guess, considered general, like, institute, like, being a general institution as of what you described, to now um, to a forensic facility where um, individuals who are charged as not guilty by reason of insanity or um, unfit to stand trial, you know, th these are, these places are considered, are now kind of being, from my understanding, are framed as like an alternative to prison. So what are the questions that we need to be asking? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. Thank you so much, comrade. Uh, other comrade in the white mask and black shirt. Um, hey, I'm gonna be short. Um, I organize with a group called HERD. We support deaf and disabled folks that are incarcerated. I'm gonna be across the park at 6 p.m. if people who are also practicing and organizing in the space wanna chat. Um, but I just wanted to, Leah mentioned that people um, can be committed on the basis of like the words of a few psychiatrists. I supported legal defense in Bellevue Hospital two summers ago, and that is still very much the case. Due process rights are a complete joke for everyone there. 
And I've been thinking a lot about how our organizing around PIC abolition has to include things like sex offender civil commitment, nursing facilities, forced drug treatments, AOT, like you mentioned, and the fight to close Rikers has to include the jail that's in Bellevue where people from Rikers go. Um, so thank you all for your contributions, and I hope to chat with some people across the street at the park. Thank you so much, Conrad. And then, um, and then, <laughs> I, th I think we've got, we're through the stack, so if uh, both of you want to respond, who wants to jump in first? Well, we I have can, six minutes. Yeah, I can briefly just respond to the, <laughs> to the first comrade asking about, you know, what if, you know, folks, you know, need care. And of course, psychiatric abolition is not about eradication of care or mm -hmm. even eradication of psychiatry. Like, it's actually not. It's the force piece, right? So what we've been fighting for for 50 years is like make the supports available voluntarily, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the problem is that too often people, if you're not bad enough, you get sent away, you can't access the services. It has to get to the point where you are considered to be a danger to yourself or others. Sometimes people in order to get help aren't even suicidal and will say, I am suicidal just so they can get help. So really just trying to really resist that and so that the supports are accessible culturally relevant, community determined, right? All the things folks talked about um, voluntarily, you know, stuff that people actually want to, to services that people want to use, then you don't, and, and stop forcing things on people that they don't want. I, I hope that that went a little bit of the ways to answering that question. Um, and I'll say, and feel free to like jump back in, but I do think there is also a strand of psychiatric abolition that's literally about psychiatric abolition. Um, in, in the sense of um, abolishing psychiatry as a medical profession, because mm -hmm. the coercion comes from that. Like we don't have it in other things. The coercion comes because a psychiatrist has the power to, I'm um, gonna use Foucault now, to tell you the truth about yourself, but you don't have that power, right? So if you, even if you voluntarily go in that's the problem with the voluntary and voluntary. I don't have to tell you. Even if you voluntarily like go in, you don't voluntarily come out. <laughs> you know, once mm -hmm. you're in, I mean, the psychiatrist needs to say that you can come out. And so the po the power of of um, of psychiatry as medicine is, you know, but but it's true that not everybody, you know, is on that train. So just know that even when we're saying psychiatric abolition, there's like different streams to it and different strands. Um, and also, I want to say that that part of the uh, psychiatry um, is, and, and Leah said it beautifully at the beginning, is race, it's gendered, it's related to sexuality, it's related to um, gender presentation. Um, you had like beautiful examples at the beginning, I mean awful examples um, at the beginning. Um, and so once this kind of like danger to oneself or other came out, and this came out out of, you know, the movements, right? Like people fought for deinstitutionalization, and what happened was those, um, partially those laws that Leah was, um, and, and court cases, not all of them were laws, court cases that Leah was talking about. Um, and once they established that you cannot incarcerate somebody for life unless um, they're a danger to oneself or others, this, you know, this is the way in. And also it's timed, right? Like there's the 72 hours and then you can extend it, but there's like ways to extend it. Um, so, the, the thing is that that even racialized it further. <laughs> um, I mean, or, or it kind of made the racial gender dynamic like even more kind of apparent in terms of who's a danger like in this society, right? And so we can't, again, we can't like take away the kind of um, anti-blackness, colonial like aspects of Sanism from underneath all that, even that some of it was for, fought by movements, uh, which of course did not want this, but this is, you know, kind of how it was taken up. So I just want to kind of um, say that. Uh, in relation to uh, alternatives, I think when we were talking about this panel, I think we were both kind of like, ew, we don't like that word, and I'll let you say a little bit maybe why you don't like it, and then I'll say a little bit like, wait, I don't like it? Yeah. Well, yeah, it just makes it sound like there's this the system that's like the real system, and then there's like these alternatives, like the side dish. <laughs> You know, and it's like, no, we're actually trying to like overthrow the carceral system and have, you know, a non carceral anti sanist, you know, abolitionist um, way of supporting people, mm -hmm. right? No matter where they're at. And, you know, so I think that's where I struggle with the alternative framework, even though I understand where it came from. Can I build on that for one second? 
it's also propping up the fucking illusion of choice mm -hmm. here, right? That, that just because an alternative exists that folks can just go and access that, like it's available and it has the capacity and it has the funding and it actually, you know, as our comrade Diana talked about, you know, does it actually do what it says it's gonna do? Or is it just, you know, a kind of kinder, friendlier, cuddlier version of a smaller um, facility that still has locked doors where you can come but you cannot leave of your own volition, you know? Um, I don't know if you wanna speak a little bit more specifically on the situation with Chicago or if we wanna sort of wrap out. Um. Yeah, I'll just say, um, you know, about the, the treatment of trauma is, um, yeah, come across the street uh, later, but also um, after this panel, I'm happy to talk to people. I already, um, you know, had conversation with some people, you know, involved in that uh, initiative. There's actually two different initiatives, like in Chicago, well, different related, anyway. Um, but the point is, like Leah was saying, um, that what we're trying to have people understand that the treatment, not trauma, kind of as a slogan or framework is not just about like the rhetoric of it, but it's literally the fact that for um, people who, were, uh, who are survivors of psychiatry or ex-inmates or um, um, med people or people um, uh, who are in disability justice uh, and psychiatry, treatment uh, is trauma. <laughs> Right, like so, it's really important when we say, let's open a mental health clinic to understand that the word clinic uh, implies uh, for some of us that there'll be the involvement of things like medicine and psychiatry and medicalization, which is different than medical care, which is different than care, which sometimes care is also, I totally agree with you, peer led, which is what we were kind of like referring to at the end as this kind of unicorn has been completely, almost completely like co-opted um, and taken up um, by the state, which is the carceral state, which is the fascist state, which is the state. Um, and so, you know, we, we um, need to have conversations about how this plays out like on the ground in different, you know, places. Um, and it's all gonna come down to, I don't wanna say like implementation, but also like the vision, right? Like what, what do the communities need? What do the communities like want? And I think even when people say open the mental health clinics, some people say invest in us, God damn it. You know, like don't close the little that we had, but it doesn't necessarily mean give us a psychiatrist and nothing else, like not housing, um, you know, no support. Um, so what if instead of that, it's um, reopening community, um, health centers, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, and so um, some of it is just about uh, the vision that I don't think we necessarily don't agree on, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just the kind of idea of how uh, people understand uh, treatment. And, and by people, I don't mean necessarily the activists that are leading this, but I mean like more generally, let's leave the room with the more expensive like vision of what, what world we can have. Thank you so much, both of you. Any final thoughts you wanna? Final thoughts? I just wanna thank everyone also for being here today and uh, having this conversation with us. I know that it's uh, sometimes hard to talk about this stuff because there are a lot of ideas and there's a lot of history and a lot of it has been hidden, but I hope you all can join us across the street, 6 p.m. by the benches right across the street, and we can talk about this more. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Beatrice. And thank you to our interpreters also so much. <laughs>